It's so wonderful to be here today. I'm Cindy Palos, and I want to introduce you to my co-host, Beth Ann Hilton, who's a marketing and communications expert, and the president of The Bee Company, which she founded in 2002 to support positive and uplifting music and entertainment. And she's done such an amazing job with that, such a friend to so many. And prior to that, she was enjoying a wonderful career in strategic promotions and business affairs at Warner Brothers, Warner Music Group in LA and New York, and PR manager of the Rolling Company and editor at Avonstar Communications. Um, you've helped so many people um, with your de depth of knowledge and your insight and your commitment to helping musicians that it's a treat to be here with you on our show, The Creators. Aloha, welcome. Aloha, Cindy. It's an honor to be here with you and co-hosting. Absolutely. And um, thank you for those kind words. And I think everyone knows your amazing history of being uh, one of the original jocks at, at K-Rock and, and doing radio all over uh, the island and uh, the Southwest in Sedona and Oh my gosh, you're a prolific creator yourself. So um, your music, your poetry, just beautiful. And thank you for everything that you give every day with your writings. It's amazing. Well, as we were discussing when we decided to do these shows is that we love the creative process and we love people who bring us music that inspires us. And so you invited an amazing woman that has such an amazing creative process going to work for her and has helped so many with her creative process, with her beautiful work that she does in Spotted Peccary Music. So um, I am very, very happy that we've decided to have Deborah Martin. You want to talk about how you met Deborah and, and, and what you have seen with her work? Gosh, well, I've known Deborah. Deborah's name and her work for a very long time, well before we met. And um, she is one of the founders of Spotted Peccary Music. She is a key and instrumental uh, person uh, in keeping it all going. Um, she, I mean, they're going on their 35th year as an independent label um, specializing in ambient electronic, um, some acoustic, some kind of world influenced music but um it's it's a great variety and i'll let her speak to that so we met finally um at the zone music awards a couple years back well probably more than a couple maybe four or five now it's gone so quickly and um deborah's just got such a wonderful energy and a, a passion for her artists and for the label so that really struck me right away and it was fun to uh, talk with her there. And then we just kind of kept in touch and kept a friendship going. And eventually they invited me and I was very honored to help promote uh, the label and uh, the artists. So uh, I do work with Deborah. She's, she's my boss, <laughs> along with some of the other directors at the company. But um, she's really just a wonderful collaborator and so supportive and always looking for new ways to um, expand and build the label and work better and smarter with the artists. But on top of all that, she is an incredibly creative resource and that's why she was the perfect person to kick off our show here. Um, she loves collaborating. Um, I would have to guess at how many dozens of albums she has to her name, um, but they come from so many different sources and uh, places within her spirit and from around the world. She's also an amazing traveler. I have severe travel envy of her life. Everywhere she goes, she picks up little gifts for all of us and shares them with us at Christmas. Like I just got the cutest, cutest little incense burner, um, like a, a little stove kind of a thing, which is uh, my son stole right away. So, um, <laughs> She's very generous. She's super creative. She has endless source, which is what I'm excited to find out about today. So Deborah Martin, welcome to The Creators. Hi, Beth. Hi. Oh, good to see you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I see you there in your wonderful home, which I've enjoyed uh, being with you and staying with you at. 
and you've got your drums behind you and all the albums and um, you're there in uh, Vancouver, Washington. Yes, yes. In the Pacific Northwest where it is currently cold and rainy, <laughs> but in here it's dry and warm. And It's so yeah. it's such a warm place that you've created and walking around your house is like being in a, the Deborah Martin Museum, you know. <laughs> wonderful artifacts you can tell a story about every single thing in the house and um your huge giant drums that you collected so anyway i guess um we'll save that for another day when we're mobile <laughs> <laughs> yes what we, what we talked about beth and i is how beautiful this creative spirit is and and i know you work with so many inspired collaborators as well and collaborations in your work we were, you know, we were just talking before we started recording about how the creative process is different with every person and in every single way, and maybe with every project. Do you find that this creative process is something that's fluid and changing, and 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 how do you you flow with it? Well, it it has to flow always because as an artist there is constant movement, constant change, the thought processes, and every artist is different. It is very subjective to the creative mind of each individual. I don't care who it is. Um, and they have very specific thoughts about how they want to work on music. We get the, the real heavy duty technical ambient electronic artist who is very much into the gear itself being able to take it and tweak it and bend it to their will, so to speak, to get that elusive sound that they want to capture out of that piece of equipment. And that is a very painstaking, time-consuming process. I have watched, and I won't say this specifically, although I am going to say it, I, I have discovered over the years that mostly it's the male artists that do this. <laughs> They love plugging in the plugs and moving things around, but it's the instrument itself, a piece of electronic gear. They'll turn those knobs hundreds of times. I've sat in a studio many, many times with artists that do this. And you just sit and you watch the process. And then after so much time, I would actually ask, what is it that you're looking for? Are, did you lose a parameter in the gear? Oh, no, 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 I have to tweak this sound. And they would take a sound that's existing in that piece of gear and manipulate the heck out of it to change the sound. So it's not even the sound that came with the thing. They make it their own. They want that ownership of it. And then they use that sound mixed in with other sounds that they've done the same thing too and that process so sometimes an album can take a year two years we've got an artist that's been working for several years on a project because every single piece has to be exact and it, then they go back and listen to it and if something's out of place they go back and redo the whole thing retweak every knob every every nuance of the sound wave that they've created and another aspect that it is very complicated. It's a complex process when you get into just pure electronics because when they get it all done and, and prepare their mix, then it goes to Howard or Ben, our mastering engineers. And if they listen to it and go, well, your mix is cool, except in this one song, there's a, there's a, a, a pat, there's a sound in there that goes way above or below the sound waves. If we put compression on it, it's going to disappear and then you won't hear it at all. And they'll have to go back and redo it. It's, it's a complicated wow. process. Yeah. yeah. That's for the techie guys. <laughs> right. And then you have the, the songwriting that you do. Oh, yes. And where does that source come from? And how do you keep that flow going when you're doing all this business stuff, especially? <laughs> well, I, I don't, uh, there's not an easy answer to that because it, it is not black and white. It's not set in stone. There's no set of 10 commandments or rules that make an artist what an artist is. But inspiration 
comes in many forms, I think. Uh, it becomes, every artist is a product of the environment that they're in. And when I create, I have many, many sources to draw from. I have traveled all over the world and continue to do so. Even amidst COVID, I have done some travel, very limited in scope with a different, you know, parameter for it. But the experiences of the cultures and the uh, just the social environs of each country I've ever visited leaves a, a very deep impression on me, not just because of it being in a different country, but because it's so similar. <laughs> We're all really all the same, but they have different rules, different types of food, different things. And the landscape itself, um, the whole cultural package is very, uh, uh, it's just very different in each place and yet so familiar. I feel like I've always been there and I just tend to absorb into it. So a year or two later, I could be walking in a grocery store and all of a sudden, blammo, there's this melody comes in my head or this instrument. I hear a cello or I hear something and I go, oh my God, what is that? Oh, and then I have to get home and, and work on it and go, what is that? I, it comes from a very deep internal place, but I'm a very external person. So um, the ability to, to balance between back and forth is hard. And then, like you said, running, uh, doing things for the label itself, all of the, you know, the the day-to-day -day operations that must happen. And I take that role very seriously because we do have a lot of artists on Spotted Peccary. And I feel very, very responsible for the outcome of what they will receive from the, you know, the efforts of their work. And we do want to get it out there. I feel very responsible for that. We have a duty to, um, to make sure that that music can get to wherever it can go while they're doing what they can do as a, as an artist to support themselves and go out and get their music out there. But our role as the label is to support that vision for them. I've always been wanting to do that. I love working with people. And um, I find that uh, the more people that you can work with and, and be involved with, the bigger the outcome, the potential is there. And I, you, you made me laugh when you said that I'm your boss. Oh my God, Beth, you make me laugh. You're, we work together. Yeah, I, I the, term, the term boss is kind of a interesting word. I, I'll have to look up the history of that word from at some point just to see what it means. But, but Beth, I, I, when I first met you, it was just a, this wonderful explosion of an infusion of energy from your brightness and your, your, just the way you spoke, very soft spoken, but so professional. And I immediately knew that we would be working together. I just had a sense of it. And so I am so grateful and thank you. You've been so helpful with the label, helping coordinate the artists, communicating with everyone, getting us all on the same page. We have a wonderful team and we do work as a team. We help each other. So if there's something I'm not sure how to do, I know I can call you and say, Beth, I'm trying to do this. What do I do? And you immediately get back to me and say, oh, we'll try this and this. And the same thing, if you've got a question, I get back to you. Our whole team does that. Right. And we have things that we're, but as far as creative process, um, I can be inspired by sitting outside and watching a, a leaf fall off of a tree. And as I watch the movement of the leaf until it hits the ground, I'm infused with this sense of the beauty of that leaf. And I'll go real deep with it and I'll go, oh, what if that was floating on a pond? Where would that, you know, where would that come from? For example, the Under the Moon album. That's a, a poignant album. It was historically very nice because it was used at the Olympics in 96. That music was used on NBC. And, but the simplicity of that album is what strikes me the most of how it came about. I was sitting in the recording studio in Southern California at the Spotted Peccary studio where I was living at the time, because this was you know, quite some time ago. And I had a calendar in there that was Monet paintings. And I love Monet. I love Van Gogh. I, I love all those artists. But I was staring at the picture, the water lilies. Mm -hmm. And I kind of went into a trance, I guess. I was just staring at the beauty of it. 
And I started imagining, I have a very vivid imagination. I've been that way my whole life. And I started imagining what would happen if those water lilies started twirling around in the water? What would that sound like? What would that? And I sat there and about three minutes later, the under the moon track was born. Yeah. I just sat at the piano and started playing. What would it sound like? What would it be in my, as my fingers moved across the keys? And I actually recorded it. And then a couple of the guys came in. Howard came in. Chris Samu at the time came in. And I said, hey, guys, listen to this. What do you think? And they both just looked at me. Did you just write that? And I said, well, yeah. Where, where, what did it, where'd that come from? And I said, well, I was looking at that picture of the water lilies and they just kind of shook their heads and walked out going oh my god you know what what do we do it's such a beautiful story and I think it perfectly explains what we're talking about is that sensitivity I think part of creators and the creative process has to always allow respect and openness to some channel of inspiration that comes and if you don't grab onto it in some way or act on it sometimes you can lose that creative thread um, I find sometimes that if I have something come to me, it might just hang around for a day or two. I come back later, but usually I want to either put it down on my, if I even have to have it on my phone as a, as a voice memo or just write mm-hmm. down a word or two, something that holds that. It's, it's almost magical. This, right. this gift of inspiration that will come to us. And, I, and as you explained it, Deborah, it's very Zen. Like for you, that was a very Zen like process of, a simple thing that you were able to capture. Yeah, and that's a good point, Cindy, about honoring it. And that's, as artists, we need to learn to honor it. For me, my gifts and visions come through dreams. I have these incredible, detailed, bizarre, other world, uh, parallel universe kind of dreams. But I haven't always honored them, thinking, I'll always remember that. It was so cool and so vivid. And now I've learned to keep a journal next to my bed. So even in the middle of the night without turning on the light, I can jot down or draw a picture. And I keep that journal because that helps it all come back to me if I want to turn it into a story or, I mean, an entire movie in some cases um, or an action. Some of them have been gifts of activeness that I needed to take on and make a call and literally call a company Uh, to save a river and it had to do with the chewing gum factory in New York and then this I looked it up and this place all existed it all lined up all these things amazing again and I'm glad you do that because anyone who wants to do a dream journal will find great gifts there because you know what that's our same part process of the mind and the many levels of the consciousness that we sometimes don't recognize it's the same consciousness that brings inspiration, music, words for me, um, you know, and for you with that consciousness is in the dream. So we, we have to embrace and honor this. And as creators, there's actually a way to feed that and to, to, to respect it. Hmm. Do you find Deborah, that there's ways that you have to honor and respect and, and give your gratitude to feed that, that process? Absolutely. Um, that is a very important point, actually. Um, I, I never take anything for granted that comes, I, I just say it comes through me. Maybe I'm just a conduit for the things I'm creating, but um, there have been moments that have been lost because sometimes I'll wake up, I'll be restless and I'll wake up at three in the morning, usually between three and four. I'll wake up because there's an idea that just comes out. I've either was dreaming it and I go, oh my God. And I'll wake up and I'll immediately get out of bed and go write it down. But there's been a couple of times I did not get out of bed. I just, same thing what Beth said, Oh, I'll remember that when I wake up. Oh, I'm never going to forget that. And then I wake up and I go, what was that that woke me up? Oh, my goodness. And then I'll spend the whole day trying to figure it out. And then I go, okay, I guess I wasn't meant to have that one, but I should have paid more attention. Mm -hmm. And I think the most important thing to remember with that is on a creative note, if you're struck like a lightning bolt with an inspired idea, a name, a phrase, a, a, a melodic note, a color, anything, 
don't hesitate and this is for all artists don't hesitate to write it down if it's if it's audio record it as soon as you can um because that is the honoring of it it means that you will remember it and then you can go back to it later if you immediately take note of it it will come back to you later and you won't be haunted by oh i wish i'd written that down or i wish i'd done that and um that has not happened to me too often, but it has happened a couple of times, more recently rather than not. And my imagination can go anywhere. Beth, I think you and Cindy both brought this up. This is extremely important. Um, whatever the mind can think of, it does exist. So that what you dreamed, Beth, that actually existed, mm -hmm. it's because the mind does think of it. And I've I remember as far back as five years old telling that to people as a kid. I would sit at a bus stop. This was in Okinawa, by the way. And I would open a book waiting for the school bus because we were on an island, of course, in the Ryukyu Islands. And um, I would read to the people waiting at the bus stop. There were adults, there were business people there, and they would just stare at me like, who's this little, oh, that was a nice story, you know, and I'd be reading out of a kid's book, but I'd be reading to them because I've always loved books and I love to read and I've always been very good with that part of whatever's in my brain. And um, it's just one of those things that happen, but anything the mind can think of, I used to tell them that, they would say, well, that's a fantastic story. It's a fairy tale. And I go, oh no, it really exists because if you can think of it, in the human scope, it does exist. And that is the premise for the Hemispherica Portalis album that I worked on with Dean. And that was such a wonderful, fun experience. And he looked at me and he goes, Deborah, these names are insane, but I love them. How did you come up with it? I said, I don't know. Whatever we can think of, it will happen. And that's really the premise I do with most of my creations. If I can think of it as outlandish or crazy as it seems, it happens. And trust yeah. it. That's where yes. the trust comes you in. And trust it. Next step, yeah. And right? believe. And you know, also, Beth, you know this, and I know you know this also. This is something happens when you make that commitment to do anything, just like maybe talking here today, but also doing music. Once you begin that process, then something else takes over. It's yes. like, okay, you open the door. And sometimes I think I'm the creator and all of a sudden I realize, oh no, this is something else going on. I never would have guessed this could happen, but obviously this little child wants its own little, you know, this, this to happen. So then you have to realize that you're just, like you said, Deborah, you're the one that's, it's coming through. And then there's other things that will happen through it sometimes that will amaze you that you never could have imagined. Right, exactly. And the music always tells you what it needs always. There's never a question. I never question it. I actually have um, had a, a few experiences well over the years uh, being in a studio and recording with other folks. And one time, this was so funny, I, I can never forget it because it's hilarious. And, and I love this artist. And, and to this day, we he actually just came and helped me work on uh, mixing a, a new album coming out in April with Jill Haley. And um, we're dear, dear friends. I love him dearly. And I was wanting to record. This is the Eye of the Wizard album mm -hmm. we were working on. And I was in his studio because we worked back and forth at our studios. And I was and he goes, OK, what are you going to play? And I said, well, just hit record. And he goes, OK, what measure do you want me to start at? I said, oh, start around measure six or eight, just so we have a little bit of a lead. So he hits record and I start playing. And he goes, well, that was cool. And he goes, now what? And I said, well, can you add another track? And he goes, sure. So he adds another blank track and he goes, now what? And I said, well, just hit record. And I started playing something else, but it was a different rhythm than the rhythm of the first track. And he stopped the recording in the middle of it. And he looked at me and said, Deborah, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm playing. Why did you stop the recording? He goes, well, you can't do that. <laughs> they're, they're different rhythms. They're not, that's not going to work. And I said, oh, man, yes, it is going to work. Can we start over again? And he, and he, he said, I'm telling you, it's not going to work. And I said, no, please, just hit record. And so he did. So I recorded it. And then I said, now, can you add another blank track, please? And just hit record. 
And he's just looking at me like I'm nuts. And he goes, Deborah, this is not going to, not just, and I played it. And then we played those three tracks back at the same time, of course, because they all were doing. And he sat back and I'll never forget the look on his face. And he looked at me and he goes, that does work. <laughs> what, what, what happened? And I said, I said, oh, Matt, I just, I could hear it inside what I was hearing, but I wasn't quite sure how to explain to do it. I just had to play it. And, and that was the only way I knew how to do it. And he's just looking at me and he is an exquisite musician and artist. He is a drummer, a bass player, guitarist, keyboard. He arranges, he's a producer. And he was looking at me like I was an alien, which probably <laughs> is true. And, um, and that was just, all, we, we joke about it. We actually joke. Now when he comes, he was just here and we were mixing something. And I said, now, Matt, that's going to work, isn't it? And he just looks at me and laughs. He goes, of course it is. <laughs> you know. I, I get that there's a shamanistic energy that you have in that magic that's carried. Yeah. And I couldn't help but think of what you said earlier when we were talking about how with that electronic music, that artist had to keep tweaking and tweaking. And what you were doing also in a strange way, electronically, listening to something inside beyond the form you bring it out on. He had to work with his electronics, but in his mind, he heard it and he knew what he wanted to create. In your inner mind, you knew. And we just have to use the tools that we have, you know. But mm -hmm. if you have that inside you and you follow that energy, if it comes from your soul or wherever it comes from, then you know what you're trying to tune it into and make that creative process happen. And sometimes our tools are limited you know but if yeah. you are true to that what you're hearing look at the magic that happens yes um there is one other thing i'm i'm not even quite sure how i could describe it but i'll do my best and if you need to edit it great but but this is it's hard to describe and i think this is true for every artist out there in, and myself i mean every artist anyone that creates there's a driving force inside of us and some artists will sit dormant for a long period of time. And then all of a sudden they explode. Oh, they're coming out with the new album. But what happens, and this is what happens for me. And I've talked to many artists that describe this similar uh, thing. I'm going to try to use words to explain it, but I don't know if they will be the right choice of words. Um, when I'm working on an, on an album project and I'm in the recording process, I'm like floating. I mean, there's just nothing else to describe it. You're right in this, in this wave, this meme of, of creative energy. That's not just you, but everyone on the planet that's in the creative forces. It's that one stream and you're all part of it. And you can feel all of that at the same time with everyone else and you get it all done and oh, and it's just this exhilaration. Then when it's over, you have to do the detail work, your liner notes, describing the album, uh, promotional materials, all of these things. And that's the drudgery part for a lot of artists. They can't do it. I go back into my imagination side to do it. And then I just, I'll sit and it just, it's just like, uh, it just like pours out like water. I'm just like, blah, blah, blah. and most of it doesn't make any sense. But when I read it back, there's all the sentences that come out in there, almost like when you're doing uh, that creative writing where you just stream it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that happens. Then the artwork gets done. Then the album gets released and it's just fantastic. And you're all excited. And then a couple weeks after that, you get the baby blues, kind of like you've given birth to this lovely, lovely being, this new element that's going to be out in the universe for whoever's meant to hear it's going to hear it. It's going to go where it needs to go. That's an automatic. I never think about that, really. I don't worry about it. Whoever's meant to hear that music is going to get it. One way or the other, even a century from now, whoever's meant to hear those tracks is going to hear it. And so there's this sense of almost like a depressive state where you're like, oh my God, now what? Oh, oh, I've got rid of it. It's almost like a mythical creature who builds up this energy force. And if they don't let go of it, they will perish. So it comes out like in, a, in the case of a dragon, a fireball, Whew, and then it, they feel better because the dragon has released the fireball. 
And then there's a moment of stillness and calmness and quietness and sadness for releasing it. But then it builds again and you got to create something else or else you don't get back into that. And it's that same, and it's a, it's just a cycle that keeps going around and around and around, never ending. And each time it happens, you are somehow changed as a person by the growth that it takes to do it. There's an internal force that causes that, that if you don't do it, you're lost. You become wow. lost because what you a can't. beautiful explanation. I have never heard it explained as beautifully as you just explained it. Really, truly amazing, Deborah. That's exactly how I feel. And that's why people like Beth are so important because you need people like that you can trust to carry that energy, taking care of some of that detail and getting it out there. Because I don't think most people who are creators may be able to express what you just expressed. Yeah. But if you're going through that, then you need someone like Beth to get it out there because you're going through this process still. You're, you're still going through mm -hmm. what you're going yeah. through, right? I understand it. Absolutely. Yeah, I see that a lot. And I, I have to encourage artists, don't give up. You know, it's this isn't the end. This is, you know, the birth. There's so much more to do. And yet it's a mm -hmm. fine line of not pressuring. But again, like being a doula. <laughs> PR doula, <laughs> but, you know, delivering <laughs> it and just exposing it to as many places and people as possible so that the right people who need to hear it can find it, you know, so it's not about ticking off, you know, this many articles or this or that, but it's really, our goal is usually to get it as many places where it can be experienced, you know, for all time. Like you said, you know, that's the beautiful thing about the internet now is that it's out there. And it um, used to be yeah. Beth in the old yeah. days, because I've been in radio so long in the old days, you'd have your A&R and PR guys. And, and it, and it was, it was a formula that they tried to sell you. And it was a little bit cliche, you know, every now and then you pretty much knew as a, as a DJ, I always knew the stuff that was good and I'd find it but they'd be out there to try to, you know, do their job and sell it. But um, it, it mm -hmm. was sometimes like, well, you know, maybe you're trying to sell me rather than the artist. I got that sometimes right. from some of these PR guys back in the day. And I always get the feeling with you, Beth, that you understand and have a, a, a deep understanding of the artist. So as you present the artist, as we are just understand the whole beautiful presentation from Deborah, we then understand what it's really about and the reason why we should embrace it rather than be sold it. And there's a difference there between being sold something versus being presented with something and understanding yeah. what's going on. Yeah. And, and I, you know, we don't present every project to every person who we know, you know, you, you are in the business and you get to know who needs what and what their audience is like. And that's the appropriate place to, to deliver that, you know, music, but it's also, you know, a conscious choice um, on our part at, at the B company to only work with, you know, the artists and projects that we know we believe in and are high quality and, you know, that have a good chance. I mean, there are people that we just can't take on and, you know, we hope that it can be received as a, a favor if we say, we just don't think it's ready. You know, it's it's not that we don't like you or don't believe in you, but it's not ready for that next level of, of you know, promotion or, you know, and that ultimately hopefully is a favor to the, to the artist or, you know, maybe they need to develop a following a little bit more or something before they That's spend their hard earned money. That's a huge job of just understanding promotion. these days. Absolutely. I mean, you were just talking about Spotify before we started. It's like, oh yeah. I mean, do I really look at Spotify? No, but then, you know, you were looking and oh, this, that, and, and we were going to share that uh, a piece that was on Spotify. Uh, yeah. That was I Deborah Martin's piece. And I'm going to do a share screen here so we can see uh, Deborah Martin's beautiful um, homepage while um, we do this and we're going to um, be able to look at, at her lovely share here while you play some of that music. Music Ooh, how about, fire. How about from Eye of the Wizard? Is there something there, Beth, from that? 
Well, I'm just pulling up Under the Moon since we referenced. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Can you guys hear that? Yeah. Mm hmm Can you explain a little about this piece, Deborah, as we're listening? Oh, yes. This is actually the piece I did uh, when I was... Uh, this is... Um, originally started out, I was playing on the guitar with this one, uh, playing a classical pattern mm -hmm. on the guitar. And instead of doing it on the guitar, took that pattern and put it on the piano. So that's the sound you hear is what I was plucking on the guitar, replayed it on the piano. Wow, that's beautiful. And that's the under the moon. The, uh, the nymphaea, which is the Latin name for the water lilies is the one that uh, is the song that has the, uh, that I did in three minutes in the studio, looking at that calendar picture of, of the water lilies from Monet. <laughs> if people go to to your home site here, DebraMartinMusic.com, will they be able to find that, Debra? Well, if they go, they'll see all of these albums, and if they click on it, it talks about that particular album. And if they want to hear sound samples of it, I think there's a link that takes them right to the Spotted Peppery Music page where they can actually hear mm -hmm. sound samples and everything else. And it'll take them to any of the links that they want to, uh, any of the platforms they want to listen on from from there. Yes. And this is the latest, the Hemispherical Portalis. This is the one that Deborah did with Dean De Benedictus, her latest collaboration. Mm -hmm. That the, when you were explaining how you watched the leaf fall and then were thinking about it, and came, I know that you know you used a similar process in coming up with all these creative names for this. Yeah. Uh, album which is beautiful inside and out spotted peccary does incredible artwork um thanks to daniel daniel's, daniel's a wizard he's another he world exactly he was able to take the descriptions that we talked about for the artwork and uh actually originally i wanted to use pieces of the artwork from the triptych of heronius bosch's garden of earthly delights Dead Can Dance used a piece of that artwork on one of their albums, but I was struck by the colors and the vividness and the otherworldly quality of that triptych, which I got to see in person at the Prado Museum when I was in Madrid. I did too. It's amazing. Now look at this piece. Fantastic. I was talking to Deborah um, a while back about how we sometimes don't appreciate how beautiful the artwork is on CDs and how I still honor having that beautiful artwork to listen to as uh, to look at while I'm listening. And, and again, this art captures again, that magic, that mystery, that beauty, and says so much um, as does the music. So, so again, yeah. people can find that um, this is the latest one. And again, yeah. even the title, you know, it's magical title, Hemispherica Portalis. It's just so, so wonderful. I mean, beautiful. Yeah. Um, it's another world truly. And yeah. I love your, your quote here. I simply close my eyes and imagine what it would have been like to exist in another time, another place, and then the music comes. Is That's that, exactly it. Yeah. I mean, isn't that amazing? Just amazing. Well, I, you know, I, I really feel like we've been able to understand your process, a creative process, your soul, your energy, and and you've expressed it so beautifully, Deborah. I, I, I mean, truly, I'm inspired by what you said, and and I have to thank you, Beth, because um, we decided we were going to talk about the creative process. And boy, I, I, I feel so much that this has expressed the creative process so well, Beth. This has been amazing, and and yeah, I think that it's um, it's going to continue in every show because source is always available, right? So. I think um, that's what I'd love to impart is that your creativity is endless. There's always a source for more, you know? So true. This is the so track from Hemispherical Portalis. I'm just bringing it up a little bit louder here. Okay. Portal of a thousand years. Yeah. yeah. 
So it has a lot of organic sounds too. And, and, and people can go to not only your website, but I guess it's also on uh, what other sites uh, can they find it, Beth? Oh, it's on every platform. Um, so you can search by Deborah Martin with a D E B O R A H at the end. Martin, you'll find it on Spotify, but it's also available uh, for audio files in high res too on um, Tidal and uh, other audio file platforms. And Spotted Peccary, yeah. yeah. And, and, and speaking of that, I don't want to forget Spotted Peccary, such an amazing platform. We, we've got to do another show just on Spotted Peccary. We're just about out of time, but Spotted Peccary is enough. Talk about a portal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's it's their 35th year. Like, this is the year of celebrating. So glad we didn't have to do that in 2020. We're doing it this year. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Well, it's been a real true blessing to be able to be here with both of you beautiful women and your inspired souls. And um, I thank you so much, Deborah, um, for being the creator that you are and also helping so many other uh, artists to create and get their music out there. Um, truly been a, a wonderful time sharing with you. So thank you, Deborah. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. It's, it's wonderful to be able to try and share the ideals of what it's like being a creative artist. And there's so many people out there that have a hard time. And I think being part of the record label give, is the opportunity to help facilitate them to realize their dreams and visions while at the same time, allowing me to create as well and then share that with all the wonderful people that I get to meet. And it's, it's wonderful talking with you. I think you're absolutely amazing and talented and your radio show that's been going for so many years. You learn so much from different people and Beth, you've been doing business and professional marketing and strategies for other creative individuals for so many years and you have helped us so much and I know that's going to continue for a long time. And I, I envision myself, even when I'm, let's say I'm 90 years old and I'm in a wheelchair and, and I don't have my teeth anymore. And I, and I'm wheeling up to a synth going, can somebody plug me in, you know, or something? I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> God bless. Yes, absolutely. I'll be pushing you up to that synth. Uh, oh, yeah. See, you'll be with your walker. You must keep creating. <laughs> you'll be with your walker going, I know I remember I wrote that down. <laughs> well, the creative process never ends. It goes on forever. So, yes. Thank you so much. God bless you and much aloha to you and uh, great talking to you today. And uh, keep creating. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.